Bien, muy buenos días. Creo que ya entonces podemos comenzar con la. Good morning. I think that we can now start with the session once again. We apologize for the slight delay. I hope you can hear us and you can see us. Thank you very much for connecting to this weekly press briefing here at PAHO on the COVID-19 situation in the region of the Americas. My name is Sebastián Olial with the communications department here at PAHO. And as every week, this session will be about an hour long. We have already received your questions via email and you can also use the Q&A button. Please do include your name and media outlet when sending your questions. As you know, we have interpretation into English, Portuguese, and French, and you can also choose any of those channels through the interpretation button. Today, PAHO's director, Dr. Carissa Etienne, will be reporting on the evolution of the pandemic in the region of the Americas, and in particular, about the situation in Haiti. Together with Dr. Etienne, we have Dr. Jarbas Barbosa, Assistant Director of PAHO, Dr. Ciro Ugarte, Director of Health Emergencies with PAHO, and Dr. Sylvain Aldiguieri, Incident Manager for COVID-19 with PAHO. Now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Carissa Etienne to share her opening remarks with us. Dr. Etienne. Thank you, Sebastian, and, and good morning, and thank you for joining today's press briefing. Over the last week, there were 1.1 million new cases and over 25,000 COVID-19 related deaths reported in our region. After weeks of plateauing and even decreasing figures, COVID-19 infections are back on the rise in all subregions except in North America. The United States, Canada, and Mexico are reporting overall reductions in cases and deaths, although hotspots are still being reported in the Canadian provinces of Manitoba, Newfoundland, and Labrador, as well as the Mexican states of Quintana Roo and Baja California. Central America is reporting the highest number of deaths to date. And today, one third of hospitalized, hospitalized patients are in the ICUs. Meanwhile, COVID infections are accelerating in Panama, Belize, and El Salvador, where new cases have doubled in the last seven days. Further south, Colombia is reporting the highest rate of infections in South America, where new cases have nearly tripled in certain regions. Brazil is also seeing a rise in new infections and hospitalizations. This trend is especially acute in some states in the Northeast in which hospitals are over 90% capacity. Uruguay, Argentina, and Chile are also on alert as they continue to report a rise in cases. Many of our Caribbean islands are also reporting a surge in infections, including St. Martin, Trinidad and Tobago, and the Dominican Republic. Today, I am particularly concerned about the situation in Haiti, where sources are reporting sharp increases in cases, in hospitalizations, and deaths in recent weeks. Although official data are limited, the risks are high as the Haitian health system is already challenged by a sharp rise in cases, especially as the number of COVID-19 hospital beds has been downsized from last year. Two variants of concern have already been identified in the country. While public health measures required to stop transmission are being largely ignored by the general population. These two factors combined are likely fueling transmission. PAHO is working with the Ministry of Health to scale up care and supplies for infected patients, as well as protective equipment so that healthcare workers can do their job safely. 
Another top priority in our collaboration with the Haitian government is to reduce the transmission of this virus by scaling up testing so the government can identify and isolate cases and quarantine those who come into contact with infected persons. It is encouraging that the government of Haiti will accept the AstraZeneca vaccine and doses will be arriving soon through the COVAX facility. PAHO will continue to work with the Ministry of Health to prepare and support the delivery of the first doses as quickly as possible. A very high priority is to offer vaccination to all frontline health workers over 18 years of age. We call on partners and organizations working in Haiti to urgently reinforce the response to COVID-19. The country will need additional health capacity as well as support to embrace preventive measures that are required to curb the transmission. Both will be decisive in the coming weeks. There really is no time to waste. The situation that we're seeing in Haiti is a cautionary tale in just how quickly things can change with this virus. And this is true for most places in our region. Since the start of the new year, we have seen a rapid increase in infections. In just the first five months of 2021, both cases and deaths have almost doubled in the region. Wishful thinking will not solve or resolve this crisis. We need action. So please let me remind you of what needs to be done to stop this outbreak. The first thing is effective leadership. This pandemic has taught us time and again that leadership determines the effectiveness of a country's response. Sadly, across our region, we've seen misinformation about COVID-19 and this has shown the doubt on proven health measures and often in the context of political disputes. By stoking controversy where there is none, our leaders are sending mixed messages to the public and are standing in, a way, in the way of effective measures to control the virus. We must unite around stopping this virus. And this should be the first priority. The second is to urgently boost access to vaccines. Effective vaccines are a beacon of hope in this crisis, and we must do all in our power to secure more doses for all nations in the Americas. We are very far from this goal, especially for the low-income countries that are still struggling to protect health professionals and those more vulnerable. COVAX has already delivered some 17.6 million doses to our region, but progress is not keeping up with the pandemic. Regional solidarity, including the donation of doses, will be key to get us through the current shortage of supply. Vaccine will save lives and prevent future waves. But for the current surge in infections, we have to deploy the tools that we have at hand. And lastly, let me remind you that public health measures remain the best way to save lives now. At a time when staying home and practicing proven public health measures couldn't be more important, what we are seeing is, is the total opposite. Mobility data from across our region shows that there is more movement within and between countries now than at any other point during this pandemic. When you combine this mobility with the premature relaxing of public health measures, what you get is the perfect environment for the virus and its variants to spread. But we know how to stop this virus. PAHO is doing and will continue to do its part 
to support the response to the pandemic in the Americas that is grounded in science and solidarity. But we cannot do this alone. We need leaders to prioritize the decisions that are required to stop this virus in its track. And we need everyone to recognize that their personal choices will not only protect themselves and their loved ones, but also determine the fate of the months ahead. Let's all work together. Muchas gracias, Doctora Etienne. Thank you very much, Dr. Etienne. Now we are going to answer your questions. We have already received your questions via email and we're also receiving your question through Q&A button. Please remember to state your name and media outlet. The first question is by Ines Capdevila from La Nación in Argentina. And her question is, does PAHO have any measures based on the data on vaccination and transmission as to when Latin America will be able to turn this epidemiological curve? Thank you for the question. This is Dr. Barbosa. We know what happened in several countries of our region in Europe and also in countries from other regions that it is possible to curb transmission of COVID-19 with the adoption of public health measures. We also know that it is difficult to have effective measures in Latin America because of poverty and also the conditions in which poor, poor people live in Latin America, informal economy. But we cannot today forecast when we are going to curb or control transmission. It is possible to forecast that we need more vaccines because at the level of vaccine coverage that we currently have in um, Latin America, it is not enough to control transmission too without a clearer expectation. It is also true that we need to maintain monitoring of the health situation in each country for the public health measures to be adapted to the situation. And third, it will be very important to also maintain individuals, societies, communities aware of the fact that the vaccine will not put an end to the to transmission tomorrow or the day after. We will need to continue to continue to implement all of the measures that we know are effective to curb transmission, such as the use of masks, physical distancing, avoiding crowds, everything as indicated. And we already have information that shows that this can not only stop the, the emergence, but also stop transmission so that the capacity at hospital level is not overwhelmed. Thank you. The next question is by Ali Rajin from PBS News Hour in the US. And the question is in English and it is as follows. P117, so much more prevalent in the region than P1, even though P1 is of a more origin. Dr. Aldighieri. Yes, thank you, Sebastian. And thank you for the, the questions. So, the, the dynamics of variants, uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants, is a process which is complex to characterize. We can say that we have a mosaic of different patterns of circulation of variants uh, in this region. I'd like to remind the press community that PAO is coordinating a regional network for the genomic surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 with seven regional reference laboratories in Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Panama, the USA, and the University of West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago, in addition of the national laboratories that are doing uh, genomic characterization of the virus. So the distribution and prevalence of different variants in the region of the Americas is relative and might be influenced by the different sequencing strategies that the countries are using and but the different capacities also uh, in countries in terms of laboratory characterization. 
But what we have observed at the moment is that the four variants of concerns as uh, established by the World Health, World Health Organization have been detected in 39 countries and territories of the Americas. According to the data from the regional network, with the exception of the P1 variant in Brazil, in many countries in our region, variants of concern are not linked to intense transmission. They have been mostly associated to travelers and clusters around travelers, again, with the exception of P1 in Brazil. It is important to note that the variants of concern are co-circulating together with many other variants, including variants of interest in the countries where they have been detected. Now, regarding the specific uh, questions, uh, regarding B117, this variant has not widely spread in the mainland countries of Latin America. However, it has been detected in many countries and territories of the Caribbean, mainly the islands in, uh, of the Caribbean. And also as an example of a complex dynamics of variants, B117 was frequently detected in Chile by the National Reference Lab during January and February, but later during March and April, it was replaced by P1 and other variants of interest. Now regarding P1, which was initially detected in Brazil and that is prevalent in Brazil. As of today, P1 remains the variant of concern more frequently detected in Latin America. So I hope that I have answered the concerns of the journalists regarding this complex mosaic of detection and dynamics of both variants of concern and variants of interest in the region of the Americas. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Now, as follow up, we have a question in the Q&A by Sofia Villamil from the New York Times. And based on variance, do you believe that the increase in the number of Latin American is due to the so-called Andean strain? As to the C37 variant, which was initially detected in countries of the Andean region, so far, that variant is not considered by the WHO group of experts as a variant of high concern, and it is not considered as a variant of interest. It is part of a broad group that includes several other variants also detected by the labs in the region as part of this complex mosaic of uh, transmission that we have at this time. We do not have that characterization associated to C37 in connection with transmission. And I hope I have addressed the question by the New York Times. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. The next question is by Melina Ochoa from UNO TV in Mexico. And she's asking whether Pajo considers that there could be, again, another outbreak after the electoral period campaign in several entities of the country, including the city of Mexico. Dr. Ugarte, thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Melina, for that question that applies to several countries that are undergoing different electoral processes as all of the social, cultural events, sports events, the religious events, where we see crowding, there is a higher risk of transmission for COVID-19. 
PAHO through its uh, office in Mexico and also the regional team have been has been in contact through the national electoral team in Mexico so that this electoral process as a whole may apply the protection measures that should be applied during a pandemic, and this also includes the electoral campaign as such, but also on voting day. And I would also like to mention that as part of the previous voting processes whereby PAHO offered cooperation and together with the ministries of health to be able to identify the situation of transmission before, during and after the electoral processes, we have observed that the increase, the surge in cases is more related to the process of the electoral campaign than to the voting day. On voting day, the measures have been applied for protection. They have been properly applied, including, for example, social distancing among individuals, hand sanitation, the use of uh, masks, the periods of voting have also been enhanced, and also the number of voting stands. So measures have been implemented on voting days. So the transmission has been reduced. And there is a very important message that we should also bear in mind. And that this is a dilemma between two rights, the right to elect our officials and the right to health. And also there is a special indication for individuals that do have COVID-19 or that are in isolation or that are in quarantine and because they are confirmed cases. They, those individuals should not vote because obviously they are risking the rest of the population. So this is a dilemma that it is very important to take into account because as a health organization, we prioritize the right to health in Mexico, such as in other countries, PAHO continues to offer that cooperation. And this includes all of the electoral process. So we highlight the protection measures, the personal measures, during voting day and it is necessary for the electoral bodies to convey the messages with accuracy and broadly because voting on voting day individuals should have all of the protection measures and also they should know what their protection measures are but also respect the rules of the voting process together as I just mentioned, but the health measures. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. The next question is from Chris Bridges from Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And his question is in English and it reads. Vacations and vaccine tourism seems to be a trend. Is this a concern for vaccine equity? Y también, are you concerned that countries with excess supply of vaccines are using them to bring tourists into their country rather than sharing them? Dr. Barbosa. Thank you for this question. Uh, the Pan American Health, uh, Health Organization has uh, highlighted since the, the beginning of the, the first vaccines that were available, they needed to have equitable access to vaccines as a main tool for all the countries to respond better to the pandemic. So of course that the, the so-called the vaccination tourism is not a, I think that a proper measure to ensure that the people that need the vaccine to be protected, to save their lives, will have access. So the most important thing now is to how to increase the access of the countries, the developing countries mainly, to the vaccines against COVID so they can have the proper vaccination coverage uh, to protect the most vulnerable, to save lives in the first moment, and also to contribute to the control of the pandemic. Now, we are encouraging countries, the, the developing countries, to make donations through COVAX. We are also calling the attention that, that uh, if we use an epidemiological criteria Latin America and the Caribbean as the most affected region in the world should, should receive a very important part of this donation in order to guarantee more access to, to, our, uh, <clears throat> to our member states, to the population of America, Latin America and the Caribbean. So the, the 
tourism, uh, uh, people that are traveling to get vaccines. This is another, another phase of the inequality that we have in our region. So probably healthy people, young people that uh, have money can travel to countries uh, to get vaccine, while people that need the elderly, people with underlying condition, with chronic disease condition, are not getting the proper vaccination. We need to ensure that the, the world need, uh, work together uh, to overcome the situation and to guarantee a real equitable access to the vaccines. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. La próxima pregunta es de Alejandro Rincón de FF. Thank you, doctor. Next, uh, from Alejandro Rincón, um, editor from uh, EFE, uh, Verifica in Latin America. Do we know, uh, what do we know about the black fungus in Latin America? Uh, Dr. Aldighieri, thank you for your question. The reason why this pathogen is called black fungus is that the involved tissues may become black. In medical lingo, we're talking about mucormycosis, which is a type of mycotic fungal infections that are invasions and which are caused by environmental fungi. And let me emphasize the word environmental. It is an infection known by doctors from before the pandemic started. And it is important to mention that the regional network of surveillance of resistance to um, 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 antimicrobial resistance provides recommendations for their laboratory diagnosis. It is a well-known disease. It is a disease that has tools that are diagnostic tools and lab tools. This inf infection, mucormycosis, is considered a fungal opportunistic infection. In recent months, we've seen an increase in cases of mucormycosis in patients with COVID-19. And the largest number of cases has been reported in India where um, approximately over 4,000 cases of mucormycosis have been reported. In the region of the Americas, we have received reports, public reports of well-documented cases in the United States, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Paraguay, and Uruguay of mucormycosis. However, at this point in time, the reported numbers are very limited. This pathogen, this fungus, majorly um, affects patients with uncontrolled diabetes, patients with AIDS, uh, and also patients with uh, immunosuppression, with iatrogenic immunosuppression, in other words, patients who have had transplantation of organs and of uh, bone marrow. In patients uh, who are seriously ill with COVID-19 on an active phase or patients who are recovering from COVID-19, there are multiple risk factors and comorbidities. For example, immunosuppression caused by corticosteroids uh, and also their status of immunosuppression. This is a risk factor to develop the infection uh, um, due to mucormycosis. In terms of treatment, there are antifungal medications to treat mucormycosis. However, the mortality rate is 40 to 80%, depending on the underlying disease in the patient or the type of infection. I repeat, at this point in time, the numbers of reports that we have in the Americas, and we have a network for reporting, are these numbers, I repeat, are small. Uh, I hope I have answered your question from Efe. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. We have other questions from Haiti, and the question is, for the response to COVID-19, how can the international community support Haiti with prevention and vaccination? Dr. Etienne. I, 
I mean, I, I would say yes, that Haiti does need a, a ramp up of international um, support. Uh, PAHA and other partners are shoring up the existing resources in the country with the highest priority on saving lives. Now, there is, however, a mounting need for resources from the international community to urgently expand care for severe COVID-19 cases in Haiti. Uh, this includes the outfitting of new spaces to manage patients, as well as the procuring of supplies, PPEs, needed equipment, and oxygen. In addition, an important bottleneck is healthcare workers, the human resources for health, and of course, the needed financing to recruit and deploy them. I would say that the second highest priority is in prevention, and the, these efforts are urgently underway to improve vaccines provided, to import vaccines that are provided by COVAX to rapidly begin vaccination. However, there is an urgent need to identify considerably more quantities of vaccine doses for Haiti. We are also verifying the possibilities for donation of vaccine doses. In the meantime, efforts are underway to mobilize the population in Haiti to take preventive measures that work to slow transmission. This requires community mobilization and community education to combat the um, vaccine hesitancy that is present in Haiti. Over, thanks. Muchas gracias, doctora Etienne. La siguiente pregunta. Thank you, Dr. Etienne. Next question is from Rick Zapata from La Prensa in Honduras. And he says the United States announced they would be 80 million of uh, doses of vaccines for the countries. Would this change the number of doses provided to the countries of the Americas, or we will continue to have the same amounts of um, that has that have been guaranteed to COVAX? And would Honduras receive more than the 20% that has been guaranteed through COVAX? Dr. Barbosa, thank you very much for your question. Uh, COVAX uh, is a facility that has had problems with many of the manufacturers of vaccines in recent weeks. All of you are aware of the situation with India and given the situation in the country because they've had a, a significant outbreak of COVID-19. And therefore the government of India is not authorizing the Serum Institute in India to fulfill the contract they had entered into with the COVAX facility. And therefore, during this month of June and even July, there will be a great difficulty in guaranteeing the uh, dispatches of vaccines uh, through the COVAX. The, um, uh, the agency that purchases is still working with the manufacturers. We have been providing the vaccines that had been guarantees. The best way to overcome the challenge and guarantee a more equitable access is with the donations from developed countries. This morning, our director participated in a global meeting with the Senia countries participating in the COVAX uh, facility and many developed countries made offerings over 130 million doses, even the United States, Spain, and other countries offered these donations. It's very important that these doses may be made available as soon as possible. With these doses, then we will, we've already been uh, in conversations with the COVAX secretariat to have the criteria so that these doses can be delivered to the countries according to the principles of equitable access. So whenever we get these doses, Honduras and other countries in the region will be receiving more doses so that they can better and immediately respond to the situation they're going through. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. The next few questions are related to Peru from Gerson Conyave from El Comercio and uh, Matias uh, from, uh, and, and 
on the chat, there's a similar question. Gerson says in Peru, the number of new cases has increased and the vaccination campaign is increasing, but they're uh, afraid of having a third wave. And the question is, is a third wave inevitable? And would the impact of this one would be lesser than the second? And uh, Peru has reviewed its uh, um, uh, um, death rate records, and uh, there has been a tripling of the number. And so should other countries in Latin America adopt a similar approach and uh, uh, update their figures of deaths in the Americas? Thank you, Dr. Aldeguerri. Uh, yes, thank you. Two questions on Peru within the context of Peru. In fact, the incidence has decreased in Peru over six weeks now, while it, it, it has 120,000 cases per 120 cases per 100,000 uh, inhabitants. The concentration of cases has been seen, uh, especially in Lima, with 45% of cases seen in um, uh, in Lima, uh, followed by Callao, Arequipa, and others. If there were any increases in Peru as in other countries in South America, this is a combination of multiple factors. But if if we continue to practice the measures of public health and avoiding crowds, it, it is a measure that continues to work. If while a resurgence in cases is possible at some point in time in the future, we at present do not have any element to indicate that this is going to happen in Peru in within the short term. However, it will be important to continue to monitor the situation and in particular in the department uh, located in the Amazon basin that are bordering other areas that are still reporting high incidences. It is also important to mention that within the context of the vaccination campaign in Peru, uh, the uh, campaign that is currently underway, the largest number of people, those under 50 years of age in this uh, age group, the campaign will happen after July 2021. Now, regarding the review of information with respect to mortality, we have received a report from the technical working group established by the Peruvian authorities. It's a very important exercise that has allowed the different Peruvian agencies to consolidate several processes of national surveillance regarding mortality and consolidate this in a unique or a single flow of information. It is important to mention here that uh, countries may have different processes regarding the organization of their different sources of information regarding mortality. And countries need to, uh, different countries need to decide how they're going to collect all those sources and or harmonize the, the information provided by these sources. But in addition, in the context of the pandemic, uh, BAHO has developed instruments that the countries can uh, use to evaluate the excess mortality associated to COVID-19. And several countries in the region have adopted this excess mortality and they publish these reports uh, regularly. And I'm mentioning among others, the authorities of Mexico as well. Uh, I hope I have responded uh, replied these two very different questions about Peru within the context of the country of Peru. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. The next few questions are about Venezuela, Nicole Chapo from Bloomberg, Gabriel Bastidas from Monitoria.com, Maria Garcia from Cornica Uno, and other um, journalists on the Q and A ask if the payment to COVAX have been completed, when the first doses will be arriving, and how many doses, and whether PAHO has some updated 
um, reports on vaccinated people in Venezuela. Dr. Ugarte, over to you. Uh, these are very important questions indeed. According to the latest update from the revolving fund of vaccines that is in contact with the Gavi, uh, up to the end of last week, 10 millions were st still pending, uh, pending payment to the uh, COVAX mechanism. Uh, however, some sources in the country through social media and other media it said that they had completed full payment. However, we cannot confirm it officially at this point in time. And according to the information that we were able to access through joint uh, uh, questionnaires uh, jointly through uh, UNICEF and PAHO uh, up to the end of April, over a month ago, in other words, the country had vaccinated 364,000 uh, people with Sinopharm and Sputnik. 75% of those uh, vaccinations, of those doses given were uh, to health care workers and people under uh, over 18 with comorbidities, older than 18 with comorbidities. Uh, PAHO renews its commitment to work for the health well-being of the Venezuelan population within and without its borders. And to the extent that we receive timely information, full information and with details, we will be able, we will be able to do our work in a much better way. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Next question is from Juan Manuel Nievas in Argentina from Chinchua News. Uh, a question is, what is the importance of the vaccination plan that Argentina uh, uh, undertook in last December? Dr. Barbosa, please. Thank you for your question. It is important to have the vaccination schedule um, up because it's not enough to only have the vaccine. You have to have a strategy. You have to know what groups are going to be prioritized. You need to have health professionals that have been trained and the whole cold chain needs to be reviewed. There needs to be good communication with the population regarding vaccines, vaccine safety, vaccine effectiveness, why you should vaccinate. Because if we do not have all these pieces in place, then vaccines won't reach those who most need it. So it is very important to have um, the plan. PAHO has provided technical cooperated cooperation to all countries, including Argentina, regarding technical guidelines and other guides for vaccination schedules and plans. Countries have good experience, uh, Argentina does, and others as well, of having held good vaccination campaigns for adults, for the flu, for yellow fever, and others. The great difficulty in, the, in countries today is, is having access to the vaccines, access is very limited in develop, developing countries because developed countries had uh, the lion's share of vaccines. So we are still looking for ways, alternatives that may allow us to increase access of the countries to vaccines so that the vaccine coverage can be increased. There is uh, uh, an estimate, the uh, data of the real world need to uh, confirm this better. We need a very high vaccine coverage in order to be able to achieve control of transmission. The countries in the regions are still far from achieving that coverage. Some people say it's 70, 75, 80% to achieve herd immunity. So it's important to have a, a plan. It is an achievement by Argentina and other countries in the region are making tremendous efforts to have the vaccines and we need to have a well-coordinated effort so that we can have a more equitable access and that vaccines can more quickly reach Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much, doctor. The next question is from Kaylin Romero from El Confidencial in Nicaragua. Question is whether Bajo has had information regarding the increase on, of contagion and transmission in Nicaragua, and how is this increase comparing to other countries in the region? She also wants to know whether uh, if there will be still um, suspension of exports from the Serum Institute in India, what alternatives are there for countries such as uh, um, 
uh, Haiti and Bolivia and Nicaragua and others uh, to have access to vaccines. Yes, Dr. Ugarte, over to you. Thank you very much. The information we received is a very stark information that not does not allow us to give detailed information about the pandemic. There are indirect data which says that there is an increase in some places the uh, health services in general are not saturated, and we hope that the actions that are being implemented in Nicaragua to control the pandemic, we have reiterated the need to have inf uh, adequate and timely information, and we are monitoring official and non-official networks in order to provide more direct technical uh, support. Uh, our team in Nicaragua is in close contact with the immunization program from the Ministry of Health in Nicaragua, and uh, we provide support so that the implementation of vaccination is done with the standards and adequate protection measures, including prioritization of healthcare personnel who are on the first lines and they should be prioritized regarding vaccines. Maybe Dr. Barbosa could answer this question. Yes, thank you very much. In our region, uh, regarding the AstraZeneca vaccine, there are three countries that are um, assigned uh, to receive vaccines from the Serum Institute from India, Bolivia, Haiti, and Nicaragua. With the problem that I have already mentioned in the uh, government of India, some measures are being implemented. One is a high level negotiation so that it will be possible for the Serum Institute of India to, uh, with an increase of production that will be starting in August, that they can distribute part of their vaccines for the program in India and the rest to be able to fulfill the contract with the COVAX facility. Second, if there is going to be a priority so that other sites that are producing AstraZeneca vaccine that those countries will be able to receive at the end of June and beginning of July. Negotiations are still underway with the manufacturers, but these three countries in the Americas and others in the world will receive priority to receive vaccines and so that they can uh, complete vaccination for those who have received the first dose. There is no evidence uh, to have uh, first an AstraZeneca and another brand of vaccine for uh, the second dose. The ideal is to have both the first and second dose be the same brand of vaccine. And uh, the uh, maximum that was recommended by the expert group, the ec uh, from so this is the recommendation from SAGE, which is three months, the maximum interim fall. And this will allow us to uh, have people receive the vaccine uh, in time uh, within this time frame to receive their second dose. So those who receive the first dose uh, of AstraZeneca that uh, receive their vaccines in Nicaragua and Bolivia, they will have uh, then their interval of three months, which is the recommendation, they will be able to receive it thanks to the fact that they will receive these um, vaccines from other manufacturers of AstraZeneca. We have this other question. Uh, in place of or until the vaccines arrives, uh, what medication is being offered to those uh, with COVID-19 in hospitals? Dr. Alighieri? Uh, thank you uh, for this question uh, from uh, Montrat. Um, I will focus, of course, my answer to the uh, clinical management, but uh, allow me uh, to uh, uh, highlight that uh, the uh, vaccination campaign against uh, COVID-19 has uh, started in uh, almost all countries of uh, the Americas. And uh, regarding the Eastern Caribbean, all countries and territories of the English, French, and Dutch speaking Caribbean in the Eastern Caribbean have started uh, the immunization campaign. And some of the challenges are more are related 
to the vaccine existence. Now, regarding uh, the uh, medication of the clinical management, um, I'd like to uh, again um, explain that the Pan American Health Organization has developed and periodically updated clinical management guidelines uh, for COVID-19 patients, including for patients in hospital. Uh, these clinical guidelines provide evidenced, evidence informed recommendations for identifying markers and mortality risk factors in critically ill patients. And it also includes supportive care, including respiratory and hemodynamic, including the use of oxygen therapy with uh, clear protocols uh, it includes pharmacological treatment, for example, corticosteroids, anticoagulants, immunomodulators, the use of diagnostic imaging uh, uh, procedures uh, for uh, infection prevention and control, early rehabilitations, and all. These recommendations are for all healthcare workers, staff carrying for patients in emergency departments and ICUs. These guidelines also uh, have the objective uh, to be used by decision makers and government entities uh, involved in the organization of the management of patients with COVID-19 in Latin America and the Caribbean. So these publications are the result of a systematic and rigorous methodological process to ensure that the available evidence support the formulation of recommendations in the context of Latin America and the Caribbean. And PAO is updating on a regular base uh, these recommendations that are available on the website, available to the public and to the medical uh, societies. Uh, but I'd like also to take advantage to stress the importance of protecting healthcare workers uh, from the infection by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, including training and availability of personal protection equipments and including the vaccination uh, uh, of the healthcare workers. So uh, I hope that I have uh, answered the concerns of the journalist from Montreal. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Próximas preguntas de Steven Cirilian, de Voice of San the, Martin, uh, y también en el chat de Orbit. So Wind. here we also have questions from St. Martin and also from the Observer. And in English it reads, region are once again preparing to receive cruise passengers, including San Martin, uh, that is to start with its home porting as per Saturday, June 5th. Uh, what is your advice for health officials, governments in the region as the Caribbean reopens for the cruise industry? E. Orwin Williams is um, preguntando, is Pajo concerned? about the risk associated with the reopening of tourism sectors across the region, even though the majority of tourists are likely to be vaccinated. Dr. Ugarte. Thank you. Uh, considering the major COVID-19 transmission events that occurred uh, on board cruise ships, particularly worldwide at the beginning of the pandemic and also at a smaller scale during last summer, uh, when several countries attempted to reopen the tourism, particularly cruise ships, we have uh, advised the countries to take this decision uh, with utmost caution. Uh, similarly, the at present evolution of the spread of the virus across the Americas uh, and in other regions, and the unknowns regarding the impact of COVID-19 vaccines, for example, in relation with uh, reduction of transmission of the virus, as well as other challenges that are uh, in place in terms of uh, access to vaccines, there, are, there is also another area that the country should consider. 
we are fully aware of the impact of tourism uh, on the Caribbean countries, particularly on uh, all those countries that have been closing for tourism for uh, many months, in some cases uh, more than a year. And uh, so we are looking very carefully and all the decisions that have been taken, particularly, for example, in the CDC and the US, but also in Europe and in the Caribbean. And we'll be uh, monitoring very closely with each national authority to provide all the support that we can so the resuming tourism would be safer, both for the tourists, but also for the local population. And of course, in those cases, we need to uh, be prepared for an increased number of cases uh, uh, in the countries where, where the uh, tourists will, will arrive. As you know, with, at this moment, the position of WHO uh, and PAHO is that we should not ask or request a certification of vaccination to, uh, to, to travel. That is also another, another issue that must be solved and the regulations must be updated in that regard. And also all the uh, protective measures taken, uh, should be taken into place when we are, we are taking those uh, tourist uh, uh, travels. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Ya estamos llegando al final Thank you, doctor. We are reaching the end of this session today. Thank you all for being with us. And I, we have a final question in English and it is, and resource gaps for COVID-19 vaccine rollout in the Americas. Dr. Etienne. So uh, let, let me say that um, if we are to end the COVID-19 crisis, we need adequate and equitable access to vaccines within a, a comprehensive approach. So earlier today, as Dr. Ambabosa mentioned, Japan hosted an event in which many countries around the world committed resources to COVAX so that the poorest nations globally can have a chance of immunizing a large percentage of their population. Of course, we welcome these commitments and the global solidarity around equity in vaccine access. Because as we've said over and over again, this is our only way out of this crisis. So, that will be crucial for supporting countries in the Americas that are AMC countries like Haiti that are relying on COVAX to expand their coverage of vaccines. But, but even with these commitments, we are months away from covering more than 20% of the population in the poorest countries of our region. And you, you know, of course, our member states will also require access to finances those non-AMC countries, they have to pay for those vaccines. So they need access to finance and financial resources to purchase vaccines. But vaccines cannot stop an active outbreak, especially with the supply shortages that we face. So while there have been funding gaps in the past, PAHO is continuing to negotiate financing packages we have done so with the World Health Organization, international and domestic partners, and member states. And these funds will contribute to strengthen the therapeutics and diagnostic processes, as well as contributing to the introduction of the COVID-19 vaccines in all parts of all countries in the region, no matter how remote. So our revolving fund is gearing up and we are working with other financial institutions um, to, um, to see if we can provide the backup for um, the access to the financial resources. But that is a big challenge for many countries in our region. I would say now that our most urgent need continues to be additional vaccines. And so I want to repeat our call for donations of vaccines to the countries of the Americas, which have a high epidemiological burden and not enough vaccines to reach a high proportion of their populations. So currently we have high transmission virtually everywhere in South America, Central America, and in the Caribbean. And preventing new infections should be a priority right now. 
As I, this is expensive. It requires resources from governments, international organizations, and donors to support the tools that we need to stop the virus. Of course, as I said, countries also need the resources required to conduct effective testing and contact tracing. We can, cannot do away with those. And people should have access to the tools that are needed to protect them, such as masks. And of course, social protection should be in place to allow the most vulnerable to stay home when the infections rise in their area, when they have lockdowns or, or curfews. We know that these strategies work, but only when resources and political will are combined behind them. This is an important time for, for the region. It is a time when we need to double down. We need to double down on the public health measures while at the same time increasing the advocacy for access to vaccines. Because we are the most affected re region, we believe that we have a legitimate right to uh, have more access to the vaccine. So again, we appeal to all to countries in the Americas, in, in Europe, et cetera, um, to donate vaccines to this region, while at the same time, we call on all of our leaders and our healthcare workers who are giving so much, but on the general public, that we all do what is necessary. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Etienne. Ahora Thank sí. you very much, Dr. Etienne. Now we have reached the end of our session today. Please remember that to receive more information, you can visit our website, www.pajo.org, and you will be able to find updated daily reports on the epidemiological and immunization situation in the region. Thank you again for being with us, and let's keep taking care of all of us. Thank you. Greetings.